Hi, I'm Mr. Garrett. I'm a resource teacher in the Office of Science. In this presentation, we're going to watch some videos and then talk about them to review concepts that you should have learned in your first, first grade space unit. Things like patterns of celestial objects, like the sun, moon, and stars, and how they move in repeatable and predictable patterns. We're then going to look at some concepts that are covered in the fifth grade space unit. This is all going to end by looking at something called lunar eclipses. Now this is a very important key because it's going to be uh, part of what we need to understand in order to support the claim that the Earth is a spherical object. Okay, so as we watch this first video clip, what I want you to really pay attention for and be thinking about is, what is the difference between rotation and revolution? What does that have to do with how the Earth moves and the moon moves? What does it have to do with celestial objects moving in space? Pay attention to the concept of time. Where do we get a year? Where do we get a day? What, what are those? Okay, what determines them? What are some of the patterns of the sun and moon that we can observe? And what's the deal with shadows? What information do shadows give, give us? What causes shadows? Our modern understanding of the solar system began with the work of Nicholas Copernicus, a Polish astronomer. The Copernican system set forth a revolutionary idea that the sun was motionless at the center of the solar system and that all objects in the sky revolved around it. Before that time, most believed that the sun revolved around Earth. Today, it is common knowledge that the Earth is in constant motion, revolving around the sun in an elliptical orbit. It takes Earth approximately 365 and a quarter days to complete one orbital path. We know this duration of time as an Earth year. Every four years, we add a day to the month of February to make up the one day difference. This is known as a leap year. While Earth revolves around the sun, it also rotates on its axis, an imaginary line that runs directly through the center of Earth's sphere from the north to the south pole. Although Earth's axis is tilted at an angle of about 23.5 degrees, it still revolves around the sun in an orderly fashion, making a flat disk known as the orbital plane. Earth completes one full rotation on its axis in 23 hours and 56 minutes. This is called the sidereal day, or the period of time it takes Earth to complete one rotation relative to fixed stars. As astronomers watch the night sky, they use sidereal time. They can count on seeing the same star in the same spot every 23 hours and 56 minutes throughout the year. But most people measure their days using solar time, the time it takes Earth to complete one rotation relative to the sun. Although it appears that sidereal time and solar time would be the same, there's actually a four-minute difference between the two. That's because Earth has not only rotated on its axis during this time, but has also continued its orbit around the Sun. To get back to the same position opposite the Sun, Earth has to turn slightly more than one full rotation, or about 361 degrees. This adds about four minutes to the time and gives us the 24-hour period we know as the solar day. Because Earth always rotates in the same counterclockwise direction, the sun always appears to rise at dawn in the east and set at dusk in the west. As part of Earth faces the sun, it becomes lit and experiences day while the part of Earth that faces away from the sun experiences night. So Earth's day and night cycle is a result of Earth's rotation. Humans have long used the path of the sun across the sky to mark the time. In fact, the Egyptian pyramids and obelisks probably serve this purpose. These tall, narrow structures cast shadows onto the ground that changed in length and position with the changing daylight. 
An Egyptian could estimate the time of day by looking at these shadows. Earth's rotation on its axis results in our 24-hour cycle of day and night. Earth's revolution around the sun determines our 365-day year. This unique interaction between Earth and the sun in a reliable pattern helps create the conditions that allow life to exist on Earth. Okay, so what's the difference between rotation and revolution? Well, rotation is when an object spins, and when we're talking about the Earth or the Moon or the Sun, we say it spins on an axis, which is just an imaginary line that goes through the center of, of the Earth or the Moon or any spherical object. And so rotation is spin. And then revolution is when an object goes around another object. Okay, now what does this have to do with time? Well, how long does it take Earth to rotate, to spin on its axis? Well, as you saw in the video, it takes about 24 hours. Okay, so we call one rotation of Earth on its axis a day, 24 hours. Okay, what does revolution have to do with time? Well, how long does it take Earth to revolve or complete one orbit around the sun? Well, it takes about 365 days. It's actually 365 and a quarter days, which is why we have leap years. But 365 days, one revolution of the Earth around the sun, one complete orbit around the sun, is what we call a year. How long does it take the moon to go around the Earth? Well, we'll see in a little bit. Hint, it's something called a month. Okay. What are some patterns of the sun and the moon? Well, we know that uh, the sun will rise in the east and will set in the west, and that repeats over and over again. And we know that the moon will go through some very uh, repeatable and predictable patterns. Okay, and shadows, what are causing shadows? Well, shadows are caused by the rising and setting of the sun. And it's also affected by the tilt of the earth. And so all of these things are predictable patterns that we can see and observe of celestial objects. So as you watch this next video clip, I really want you to pay attention to and think about what causes seasons. On Earth there are four seasons. What causes them? And what the heck is something called a solstice and an equinox? What are those? It's easy to imagine that the seasonal changes in the weather are the result of the distance between Earth and the Sun at any given point in time. And that because of Earth's elliptical or oval-shaped orbit, it is cooler on Earth when we are farthest from the Sun. But Earth is at its closest point to the Sun in January, the time of year when the Northern Hemisphere experiences colder winter months. When a planet is closest to the Sun, it is at perihelion. Earth is farthest from the sun in July, when the northern hemisphere enjoys summer. This point in the orbit is called aphelion. If the distance between Earth and the sun doesn't cause the weather differences that mark changing seasons, what does? Earth's tilt is largely responsible. Because of this angle, there are periods when the North Pole is tilted toward the Sun, and times when it is tilted away from it. Around June 21st, the Northern Hemisphere experiences the summer solstice. This is the longest period of daylight for the year in this part of the world. The Sun is directly over the Tropic of Cancer, a line of latitude 23.5 degrees north of the equator. The North Pole experiences 24 hours of daylight. This is the first day of summer. On this same day, the southern hemisphere is most tilted away from the sun and is experiencing its first day of winter. In fact, the South Pole experiences 24 hours of complete darkness. Six months later, around December 21st, the Northern Hemisphere is tilted away from the sun and experiences its winter solstice. Direct sunlight reaches its most southern point, 
directly over the Tropic of Capricorn at 23.5 degrees south latitude. The southern hemisphere experiences its summer solstice. Because the sun is higher overhead during the weeks before and after a summer solstice, the days are longer and warmer. A hemisphere experiences winter because the sun is lower in the sky. There is less direct sunlight and the days are shorter and cooler. Twice a year, the north and south poles are equidistant from the sun and the amount of daylight and night are equal in length. Known as an equinox, this occurs when the sun is directly above the equator. The vernal equinox marks the beginning of spring in the northern hemisphere. It happens around March 21st. The autumnal equinox occurs around September 23rd. Days and nights at the equator are always about 12 hours long. The farther north or south you travel from the equator, the more obvious the lengthening and shortening of days becomes. In far northern latitudes, including parts of Alaska, some areas spend two months around the winter solstice in darkness. The sun never rises. But in the period around the summer solstice, the sun never sets. Seasons vary depending on where you live but they are all determined by the tilt of the Earth. So what were the causes of the seasons? Well, it's the tilt of the Earth. Does it really have much to do with the distance that Earth is from the Sun? Well, not as much as you might think. Remember what you saw in the video, it's actually kind of weird that in January the Earth is actually closest to the Sun for the northern hemisphere and that's when it's the coldest and then July when it's the warmest we're actually the farthest from the Sun so that's weird so it really has to do with the tilt that 23 and a half degree tilt as Earth is uh, revolving around the Sun that's what causes our seasons so what are these things called solstices and equinoxes well there are two of each there's two solstices and two equinoxes solstice is when uh, we, we have either our longest day or our shortest day. Our winter solstice is when we have our shortest day and our longest night. And that happens uh, right around uh, December 21st, right around the end of December. And our, um, our summer solstice happens around June 21st. And that's the start of summer. And that's when we have our longest day and our shortest night. Now the equinox, okay, that is when we have equal night, equinox, equa and nox means night. And so that's when we have almost a 12 hour day and a 12 hour night, we have equal day and equal night. And that happens in the vernal equinox. Vernal is just a fancy word that means spring. And that happens around March 21st. And then we have the autumnal or the fall equinox. And that happens in September. And that's when we have an equal amount of day and night. So as you watch this last video clip, I really want you to be thinking about what exactly is the moon? How is it a satellite? Uh, what does the moon have to do with tides? What are some of the phases of the moon? And what is an eclipse? And be thinking about because this lesson deals with us being able to come up with evidence that the Earth it has a spherical shape. Well, what does an eclipse have to do with that? The moon is Earth's only natural satellite. Just as Earth rotates on its axis while revolving around the sun, the moon rotates on its axis while revolving around Earth. The moon rotates much more slowly than Earth does. It takes a point on the moon about 29 and a half days to complete one full rotation and return to the same point relative to Earth. It also takes the moon about 29 and a half days to revolve once fully around Earth. This period is known as the synodic month. Because the revolution and rotation periods are the same, the moon always shows Earth the same face. We call this the near side. 
The part of the moon that never faces Earth is called the far side. Why is the moon's rotation on its axis the same duration as its revolution around Earth? Believe it or not, the answer lies in the tides. Just as the moon's gravitational pull on Earth causes tides, so Earth's pull on the moon has the same effect. This relationship is called tidal coupling. Since the moon's body is solid and rigid, these tides are not easily perceived. But the effect of tidal coupling is great. Over time, this gravitational relationship has led to the synchronization of the moon's rotation and revolution around Earth. From Earth, the moon appears as a spherical disk, illuminated by sunlight. As the moon orbits Earth, we see more or less of it depending on the position of Earth between the sun and the moon. The moon's changes in appearance are called phases. When the moon is between Earth and the sun, the near side of the moon receives no light and cannot be seen. We call this the new moon. The moon's appearance continues to change from just barely visible to partially illuminated to fully illuminated. When Earth is between the sun and the moon, the near side is fully lit and is known as the full moon. Then the cycle reverses. Each lunar cycle lasts 29 and a half days. Sometimes one celestial body obscures another. This event is known as an eclipse. A lunar eclipse occurs when Earth comes between the sun and the full moon. A lunar eclipse only occurs when the moon is full. In essence, Earth casts its shadow onto the moon and blocks all sunlight from reaching it. When the moon is totally eclipsed, it can turn deep orange or red in color. The dust and clouds in Earth's atmosphere cause this reddish hue, just like they cause the colors of a sunset. If Earth had no atmosphere, an eclipsed moon would always appear black. Other celestial bodies can also have eclipses, such as when Mercury blocked out a portion of the Sun on May 7, 2003. When the Moon moves between Earth and the Sun, it causes a solar eclipse. The Moon blocks some or all of the Sun's light from hitting part of Earth. On June 21, 2001, people in Lusaka, Zambia witnessed a total eclipse of the sun. Shadow band. Oh boy! The narrow path of the eclipse traveled from the southern Atlantic to the Indian Ocean. During this eerie twilight, darkness descended, the stars came out, and crickets started chirping. Not every solar eclipse is a total one. Partial eclipses, also known as annular eclipses, occur more frequently. Annular means ring-shaped. In an annular eclipse, the moon appears to cover all but an outer ring of the sun. Solar eclipses offer us a unique glimpse at the sun. With the majority of the light blocked, we can see features such as the glowing corona and fiery prominences. These views have been so useful in furthering our knowledge that on December 12, 1995, NASA and European Space Agency scientists launched a spacecraft called SOHO to continuously capture eclipse images. The gravity between the Sun, Moon, and Earth maintains a system of orbits and rotations. Understanding the relationships of the Sun, Earth, Moon system offers insight into everything from the phases of the Moon to the seasons of Earth. Now that you've watched the video, you know that the Moon is Earth's only natural satellite. A satellite is just a term we use for an object that orbits or revolves around another object. And so the moon 
is really the only natural satellite that we have. Okay. Now, what does it have to do with tides? Well, we're learning about gravity. That's what this whole mini unit is about. And uh, anything that has mass, anything that's made up of stuff, okay, has gravity. And because Earth and the Moon are really big, they have a lot of gravity. Now, the Moon is smaller than Earth, but it's still really big. It's a lot bigger than you and I are. And it has gravity. And so Earth and the Moon are pulling on each other. And so what happens when the moon pulls on Earth, water is able to move. And so when the water moves toward the, the moon, we have high tide. And when it moves away, we have low tide. Okay, we have about two uh, tides a, a day, two high tides a day, rather. Uh, moon phases. Okay, well, what are the phases of the moon? Well, we're not going to go into every one of them, but the phases of the moon, we start with the full moon, where you can see the whole uh, front near side of the moon, and then it waxes, or excuse me, it wanes, which means it gets smaller and smaller until we get to a crescent moon, and then eventually it goes to a new moon where we can't see the moon at all, and then it waxes, which means it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger until we get back to the full moon. And this takes about a month, okay? So that's called a lunar cycle or the phases of the moon. And then eclipse. Well, the eclipse is when the Earth's shadow partially or completely blocks the light of the sun. So Earth's shadow is going across the moon. And so we see that from Earth. And what's really important about that is when we look at that, we see a curved line as it starts to go across the moon. Why is that important? Because that's evidence for us here on Earth that our planet is in fact a sphere. Our Earth is not flat, it's got a curve. And why is that important? Well, we're going to unpack that in our next lesson. But for now, we need to know that an eclipse is when the Earth partially or completely blocks out the sun's light, and it is called an eclipse, and we can see that curved shadow, which proves to us that Earth has a spherical shape.